Good morning, Year 10. How lovely to be here with you. Um, Mr McKenzie is recording this session, which is why I'm standing right back here, um, so that I'm appearing really tiny in the screen. So if you're watching this in the future, hello from past me to future you. Um, what we're doing this morning is we're going through the new task. I'm giving you out the new task this morning. I know you're going, what? We've just handed in the other task. That's the way this works. It's still based all on your same unit about sacred stories. So I've opened up here on the screen. This is Mrs Merrifield's class, but all of your class pages will look pretty similar. And when you're looking for the new task, it's this one here called assessment task to F1 investigation. So it does seem a little bit odd because you've just done F2. We did invert the order of those tasks because this is in, in this lovely syllabus we're doing, it's called Unit F, Sacred Stories. So I'm going to click into that one to show you the task sheet. And I've also added in here some companion documentation which we'll look at. And then I've also made a PowerPoint which you'll be able to access. And should you need to, when you have forgotten everything I've said today because it's been overwhelmingly exciting, um, you can go back and look at all of this material. So I'm going to open the task sheet first. There it is there. Look, Year 10, 2023 r Task 2, F1 Investigation. And I shall open that one up. How exciting to be with you guys this morning. And I'll make it bigger. So this is possibly looking a little bit differently laid out to the last one, but it should be very clear for you to see what's going on. So this will be due, look at this already, term three, week five. Term three, week five. So this unit of work that you're doing, because it has to go for the equivalent of 35 weeks, that's why you started at the beginning of the year and it goes all the way to then. Um, after that, we start your next unit, which will carry through into the first half of grade 11. So even though you might change your Christian studies teacher and you might even change the actual class of people that you're sitting with when you move into year 11, the unit of work continues over because, well, I don't know about that. I don't have power over that. She'll, she says that now, but then she'll go, but now I don't have year 10s and I love the year 10 course. We know what Mrs. Merce is like. Okay, so we will, once I have explained this to you, from tomorrow's lesson onward, you'll be working in your classes with your teachers to work through this task. That's pretty well what the lessons will be used for. This context you already know because that's the same context we have for the task you have just submitted. So we know we're learning about sacred stories. You have been learning about Christian sacred stories, but you've also done some work on indigenous sacred stories through so far this year. Of course, there are sacred stories to other cultures and religions too, but we don't have time for us to teach you all of those. But if for this task you think, well, actually, I'd be really interested to do a sacred story to um, a, a different group of people, so maybe something that relates to the Muslim faith or something that um, particularly um, applies to, say, Hindu people, you can do it, but it's going to be a little bit harder for you. If you stick with Christian sacred stories, you've already got a lot of background knowledge. Similarly, Indigenous, you've been doing a lot of work on that. So whilst you can choose something else, keep your life easy. You're not going to get more marks if you do something really out there. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at sacred stories. So this task is asking you to think about how the stories are communicated to people and are there different ways that make stories more accessible and more interesting for people to engage with them? So the little top bit of this task says, other than listening to, so if you're in Christian studies class or maybe you went to church or maybe your family are reading you Bible stories or sacred stories, or maybe you're an Indigenous person and you live in a community where they share orally the sacred stories. So other than reading them or hearing someone reading it to you, how can a sacred story be shared with a community? So it's about the way it's told. What impact can this mode of storytelling have on the audience? So is it going to have more of an impact? Is it going to make the story resonate with them more? Is it going to make it maybe more engaging or easier for them to understand? 
can alternative modes of storytelling enhance the audience's connection to the sacredness of the story? So, of course, part of a story is where we just listen to it and go, well, that's a pretty cool story. I quite like the story of Noah's Ark. That's nice. I had that since I was really little. I had toys. I like the idea of the animals going two by two. But for some people, the sacred bit, the bit about God making the world destroyed and and clearing away all that sin and then creating new life at the end of it, that amazing magic of the sacredness is really important. So that's part of what you're looking for. It is an individual task, so that's bolded here for you. Individually, you are going to collect and examine information, so that involves research, to form either a written or a spoken response to the framing question. So when you ultimately come to hand this task in, you will either do a written task, which I think most of you will prefer to do, and that might be in the form of an essay or a, a report, something like that, or you might choose to do an oral presentation. If you do the oral presentation, your written notes will still need to be handed in for us to have a copy of that and to check that you created those words yourself and did not plagiarise or use AI to create that response. Okay, um, and then we've got some extra um, elaborations which I'll go through with you. Here are the um, objectives of what you need to do. You need to refine the question. So we've got this stuff up here and you're going to turn that into a, a thesis or a question yourself. You need to, through the task, explain the principles and the practices. So the practices means the actual storytelling, like how do they actually tell the story. The principles are the theories behind it. Um, you're going to examine stuff. You're going to compare some options about it. Then you're going to make a decision and then you've got to communicate it. So that is all pretty clear. If you do the written response, you can write up to a thousand words. You don't have to write a thousand words, but that is the maximum. Some of you are going to say, what's the minimum? What's the minimum I could do? The syllabus doesn't specify that, but from the old syllabus, I would say 600 words minimum. I think you'll probably need nearly a thousand to do your response. If you choose to do the spoken response, you have a maximum of seven minutes to do your talking. So that all the syllabus does is provide us the maximum limits. Speak to your teacher or if you um, would prefer, you can come and talk to me. We are giving you 10 to 15 hours of classwork and homework time to do it. Um, and here is what we need to do. Hang on, let me just scroll that further down. I'm going to show you this bit. We've got some checkpoints along the way. So these checkpoints are to assist you to make sure you're on the right track. It's also to check that you have got academic integrity, that you are not just taking ideas from someone else, that you're actually processing the ideas and coming up with the work yourself. So um, term two, week seven, so that's only a couple of weeks ago away, you will have already completed the investigation stage. That means your brainstorming stage. You've, you've gone, this is what I think I want to do. Um, and that first stage can be group work. I'm going to go through that with you and explain how you can do that brainstorming stage together with some friends. And you will have conferenced with your teacher about that. I put there at lesson five, so lesson five of our teaching. Term two, week nine, so before we go on holidays, because week nine is the last week of this term, you will have written your thesis. That means your focus question, your main thing you're arguing. You will have structured your research material for analysis into an organiser or dot points. So you will have gone, done some reading, done some research, and you've got your dot points of all your research that you've taken. Or maybe you prefer to use a graphic organiser. You're going, well, this mode, here's my points here, and I'm comparing it to this mode here. I'll show you some of those options. You'll also, at that time, and I'm sure all your teachers in your other subjects say this to you as well, every time you're researching a site, you need to keep a record of what that reference site is so you can do a proper and comprehensive bibliography later. Don't go, oh, I closed all my tabs and I can't remember where I was looking for that. Copy it, paste it onto a document, start just keeping a record of all the sites you reference. 
Um, when we come back next term after we've had our lovely long winter holiday, term three, week three, will be your complete draft. And I've got the date there. That's by the 27th of July. Your draft will be into your teacher. Of course, if you have a draft ready earlier, your teacher will be more than happy to look at that. We like it when we get them earlier because we don't have 30 to do all on one weekend. Because you can imagine doing 30 takes the entire weekend. Um, and then your final response will be handed in by August 11. That, that date is already in your My Unity page as well. So that is the deadline date for the end of that and then we start the new task. Here's all the authentication strategies to check that you are doing the work yourself. Here is the pull into an ISMG. Well, they have actually called that that now, look. And they go sort of to the other ones. Okay, I'm going to close that task sheet and I'm going to the next document with you. So this is the one called companion document. So this is sort of like scaffolding. And this one will be useful to help you work through your steps. Make that bigger. So once we finish talking today and everyone is clear what they've got to do, this is the steps we're going to do. So first step is your preparation stage. This bit you can do with a little small group of friends and I recommend those are friends who are in your same Christian studies class because you're together today and you can sit with any friends today but of course from tomorrow you're just going to be in your class. So you can brainstorm together. So once you finish with me and you're like, oh, wow, I've got a really cool idea. I want to do it on that. And you've got friends equally as excited because Christian studies is the most exciting subject. Start brainstorming together, you know, on paper, on someone's computer, whatever. Start doing that together. Together, you can also develop your focus. You can go, oh, I'd really like to focus on this. And you might all go, yeah, I'd like to focus on that as well. That'd be really fun. Let's do that. And you might even start researching together and between you, you might go, I'm going to start looking at this reference and your friend starts looking at that reference and you're putting the information, you're going, here's some good dot points and you're sharing the dot points with each other. It's going to make it much quicker for you rather than you reading four sites and your friend reading four sites, share the information with each other. You know, of course, grade 10, we're not just going to copy and paste big chunks we're going to process it through our brain and write it in our own words in dot points. That bit you can do together. Now, this bit's a bit interesting for you to decide. This is part of you coming up with your focus. What type of sacred story would you like to do? So, the one that's really obvious to us all is an existing and shared story. For example, before, the story of Noah and his ark. Or you might like to do the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Or you might like to do the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. Or if you're doing Indigenous, you might do the story of the Rainbow Serpent or some other sacred story for Indigenous people of a particular region of Australia. So that's an existing story that happens and people know the story and they share the story. But there's a different type of sacred story which is this one on the other side there where it says an experience where someone feels God and this becomes their sacred story. So I'll go through this with more detail with you shortly. But for example, if you are a Muslim person, something that's really important for Muslim people is that they do this thing called the Hajj, which is a pilgrimage where somewhere in their life they have to go to the Holy Land at Mecca they travel there and they, they go on this journey. They, once they land in the right country, they walk together with other believers and they get to this really sacred place. I've got pictures to show you later. And when they get there, they walk around and around and then they all do prayers together collectively. It's like being in a really big church service outdoors with lots and lots of people. When they finish that, they feel their heart is changed. They feel closer to God from having that experience. That becomes their story. It's their sacred story of their sacred experience. So even though that's not a written down story in the Quran, it is a sacred story for those people. 
Similarly, and we'll quickly look at it later, traditional Indigenous people, and it does still happen for some Indigenous people today, they have song lines, which I'll talk about. So those are areas that travel around Australia and they have songs that they sing that talk about the location, talk about the ancestor spirits, their connection to land in that place, and it's like a map that they tell on the story. And for those people, that is a really sacred experience and sacred story. So have you got your head around those two different types of story? Some of you might go, oh, that's too hard. That's too out there for me. I can't do that. I'm just going to pick an existing story. That's fine. You can do either way. Um, I have said before, I recommend you choose from Christianity or Indigenous spirituality, but you can do others once you check it with your teacher. So like I said, you might go, I want to do Hindu, I want to do North American Indian, um, I want to do whatever it is from Tonga, you decide. Um, preparation stage two. So that's, that's all our thinking at the beginning that you can do with a group. Then you get to the individual bit. This stuff you have to do individually. You're going to decide on the mode of your response. Do you want to do a written or a oral? Um, you're then going to start to really make your own personal question or your personal thesis. So this will be where it starts to differentiate from what your friend is going to do. So you can't do exactly the same question as your friend. You're then going to start going, well, all that stuff I've researched, I'm going to start putting this in order. What way should I order this to best communicate it? And even though we've shared that research, I need a bit more now. Now that I've refined my question, I've got to do a bit more research. I need to find a bit more stuff. Um, then you're going to analyse your material. What does that material tell me? What, what's the answer I'm coming to? If you want to, you can do a compare and contrast, which I will show you. So you might compare and contrast two ways of sharing a story, or you might compare the one way of sharing a story, but two different stories that are shared the same way. Um, and then you've got to put it together into the draft and polish it from the feedback you get from your teachers. Now, here's where we get into the possible modes and a scaffold, but I'm going to change over to my PowerPoint I've got now. So I'll just bring that one up. Um, sorry, the PowerPoint is not as fancy as I would like it to be because I was making it yesterday afternoon from about 4 till 6 p.m. and my eyes were getting very sleepy. So we talked about this. What type of sacred story? You can either do an existing or shared story, oh, like a book, or an experience where someone feels like they are getting close to God. And that's that picture of the person walking around that round thing there, which is called a labyrinth. It's a Christian thing where it's like a maze and you walk around it and at different points you can pray or meditate or consider different stories to help you come to a personal understanding or enhance your relationship with God. That's what that's a picture of. So here are the modes of story sharing. If you are someone who has any remote interest in anything artistic at all, you are going to get excited by this task. When Mrs Merrifield and I started writing this task together, we both got really excited about this bit. So artistic ways that stories are shared include art. So in art, there's paintings, drawings, frescoes, sculptures, stained glass windows, rock art, tattoos, totem poles, you might think of more. It could be through music and the music could be hymns. So that's like the old fashioned songs people sing in church. Songs like contemporary worship songs like we do here. Music for a special purpose. So like the song lines I talked about before with indigenous culture. You might like to do drama. So anything that's like a play, that is sacred. And there's special ones which are called passion plays. You may not have heard about them before, but I'll go through that. There are lots of musicals, particularly on Christian faith stories, which I'll do. Or you might like dance. So Christian faith has got liturgical dancing, but also we know Indigenous cultures use dance as a mode of storytelling. Um, and other cultures also have traditional cultural dance, which is connected to their spirituality. So that's all the artistic ways. 
that a story could be told. So you're thinking, oh, maybe stained glass windows. I've seen an old church that's got stained glass windows. I know that's pictures of Jesus and Jesus people. Does that tell a story really effectively? Can someone really connect with a story that way? Or, oh, when I'm older and I finish school, I'm going to go on a holiday to Italy. I'm going to go to the Sistine Chapel. I'm going to look at the frescoes that Michelangelo painted all over the ceiling because that is so amazing that that artwork is there and it tells these stories from the Bible. Or I'm going to go to a remote indigenous community and I'm going to experience the rock art that is there and someone who is indigenous and speaks language is going to share those stories with me in the place where it happened. If you are in Mrs Blundell's class, you've got a slight benefit on this one because last year Mrs Blundell and I had that experience to Central Australia where we did get to go on the lands of traditional owners and they took us to those places and they told us those stories and they told us about their song lines and we got to feel it in our hearts. So even though we're Christian, we could still feel the sacredness of those stories. So that could be something. Um, why am I just yabbering on about that? Next one. Mode of storing. So this is the other one. This is the ones where it's an experience. So if you're someone who goes, I really don't engage with art in any way, shape or form, even though it surrounds me every day in my life in the form of television and music, you might choose to do an experience. And that big picture with the big square box in the middle, that's the Hajj. That's that Muslim pilgrimage I talked about. Look how many people go. It's really, really important for them. But there's also things that are just walks. So there's lots of Christian walks um, that people like to do, particularly that's what that, um, the picture down the bottom is, is people going on one of those walks through a European location where you walk from one traditional spot where maybe, say, St Peter was one time and you walk to the next place where maybe St James did something. And when you go along there, you go to sacred places and hear stories. And the one at the top is a picture of some song lines through Queensland, so Indigenous song lines. And you saw previously the picture of the labyrinth. So that's modes of storytelling. So this is if you are interested in doing the experiences. I'm doing this quickly. You may find more than this, but this was a quick Google search for me to find some to help direct you. You are very welcome to choose any of these if you want to. This can be a starting point for you. So these are some cool walks. These are experiences. So there's these, these first three are Christian ones. So the Camino de Santiago, which is in France and Spain. This is a really well-known one. Probably the best-known pilgrimage on earth, the Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James, is the granddaddy of spiritual journeys. So lots of Christian people like to go and do that one. You might go, I'm just going to put that in, look it up, find out. I'm going to do it on that. Uh, the, I can't pronounce this. I need my Irish friend to pronounce it. The Crow Patrick of Ireland. The Crow Patrick. Uh, more than a million people from around the world annually break the routines of their stressful, hectic day-to-day -day lives and travel to Ireland. And why wouldn't you? It's a beautiful country to follow in the footsteps of St. Patrick. And there's other ones that are sort of smaller like that. And there's also the Way of St. Francis in Italy, inspired by the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Some of you might have gone to that primary school. The Way of St. Francis is essentially a route that connects important places or sites in the life of that famed saint. You could do that. These next ones, these are not Christian ones. So these are other religions. So there's Adam's Peak in Sri Lanka. This is a site that is revered by Muslims, Buddhists and Hindus. Buddhists claims that it's the footprint of Buddha. Hindus say it's the footprint of Shiva, um, known as the destroyer god, while Muslims believe it is the first place that Adam set his foot on earth after he was expelled from heaven. So that might be something you think is really fascinating. Um, and potentially if you did that, you could say, I'm sharing the story from both the Buddhist and the Muslim. You could do a little comparison there. I'm um, probably going to mispronounce this one, the Shokoku Henro from Japan or the 88 Temple Pilgrimage. This one sounds massive. If you're a hiker, it sounds like something cool to do one day in your future. Uh, for more than 
1,200 years, countless pilgrims have circled the mountainous island to visit its 88 temples on foot, dressed all in white and wielding a walking stick. It takes months to do this one. But that might be interesting to you. Or Mount Kailash in Tibet. The Himalayan mountain range is home to a smorgasbord of religious sites, the most significant which is undoubtedly Mount Kailash, considered sacred by five different faiths, including Buddhists and Hindus. So if you're someone who likes the idea of experiences, maybe that is one you could do. There's the Hajj. There's also lots of pilgrimages to Jerusalem. It's important for the Jewish people and for Christian people. There's a picture there of a Hindu pilgrimage. They do lots of pilgrimages down to the river and they do ceremonies and things like that. And there's a picture of the Christian, another picture of a Christian labyrinth. If you have any friends who go to St Andrews, they have a labyrinth down there. We are hoping to build one here in coming years. I don't know if it'll be built by the time you are here, but they're a lovely, quiet experience for you to do. Miss Mercer has something. There probably is a Serbian pilgrimage that I don't know about, but he is welcome to look it up and have it approved by you. If you come from a cultural background and you know of that through your family, go for your life. That would be really fun to do. Indigenous song lines. Now, I'm not going to click on these links because we don't have time, but these have all got links embedded, which are a really good place to start your research. They go to YouTubes of proper, these ones here are Indigenous people explaining to you, singing the songs, telling some stories. So if you think, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, maybe this is where you want to go. If you would like to do songs and music, this one here is, I found this one fascinating. They actually talk, and if you're a music student, you might find this fascinating. They talk about how the noises that they make in the didgeridoo actually mean different locations. So he plays like that little kookaburra noise and he says, this is relevant to the people of this part of Australia. And then he plays a different noise and he says, we know this noise means this kind of thing. So then he plays a song and he says, from this piece of music, Indigenous people would know that you're travelling from here to here to here because it's a music map, which is really awesome. Um, I've also put a couple of really excellent of my favourite old-fashioned Christian hymns, How Great Thou Art and Thine Be the Glory. So Thine Be the Glory, that's an example of a hymn that's actually singing a story. It's talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection. So it is a sacred story written in the lyrics of the hymn, sung by a massive choir in this instance. How Great Thou Art is not actually telling a story, but it, it's um, singing of a sacred experience. It's singing about this connection to God. So if you want to do songs or music and you pick a song you want to do or a hymn you want to do, say you did the song Amazing Grace, we all know that. There's also contemporised versions of that that um, mash up a couple of songs together. You might do a comparison and go, here's the story of Amazing Grace. Here's why the guy wrote it. Thanks, Mrs. Blundell. Um, why he wrote it, because that's part of the sacred story. Here's what the lyrics are about. Here's what the music does. Here is all the languages it's been translated into, why it speaks to so many people. And here's how Hillsong have changed it to make it even more exciting for a contemporary Christian audience. Um, so that's songs and music. Visual art. Um, those two links there are on stained glass things on stained glass because that's where I started thinking about art was with stained glass windows you may have been to churches that have got amazing stained glass windows and you sit potentially you've gone for a wedding or a christening or something in a church like that and you can be distracted by these beautiful windows and the way the light shines in one of those is like a history of the glass and how it's happened and how it's shaped architecture and the way our world is created. Um, another one just sort of goes through these different churches in America and she's like, in this church, this is what the pictures are in the window and this is a really great story and in this one. But there's so much. I could have spent 
two days looking at this stained glass. It was fascinating for me because I'm artistic. I like it. You might go, no, I just want, I want to do stained glass windows and I'm going to find stained glass windows and I'm going to talk about this one particular one in this church and how it's been there for a million years. Or you might go, I'm going to talk about this story of the Last Supper on this window, how it compares to this story of the Last Supper on this window and how it compares to this story of the Last Supper. So it could be the same story on different windows. Yep. Um, I've also got on there just a painting because we know there's lots and lots of European paintings. Um, They could be paintings that are in galleries. They could be contemporary paintings. They could be um, um, like frescoes, like I talked about before, painted on church ceilings and um, walls and things like that. There's a picture of Indigenous rock art there. Don't just pick random rock art. You've got to pick the rock art that's actually something sacred and then tell us what is the sacred, what is the story, what people is it sacred to. Don't just go Aboriginal people. Find the country that it belongs to and the story that it belongs to. Um, That's a really big statue of Jesus. So you might even go, I want to do statues. I'm sure you've seen in um, Brazil. There's that massive statue of Jesus. Is that in Brazil? Yeah. It's like huge. It's like a skyscraper. It overlooks the whole city of, is that Rio de Janeiro? (laughs) Yay, pick me for a geography teacher. Um, Like, And you've probably seen it even if you watched that cartoon when you were little little Rio. I think it was in that. Um, But you could do that. Like why build this massive statue? What does that mean? And then I've also put a, um, a totem pole on there. I didn't get the story of that. Sorry, I was just quickly finding images by this time last night. And a cultural tattoo. So you can't just go, I'm going to do random tattoos, but say you do want to do tattoos and you find contemporary tattoos where people have got Christ tattooed on them or they have like the crown of thorns around their arm. What is it that would drive someone to want to have religious images tattooed on their body? Or if it's non-Christian, so it's a cultural tattoo, what do those patterns mean? How do those patterns relate to their story? How do they help create their story? Musicals. Ha, ha, ha. Some of my favourite. You could do your whole thing on Jesus Christ Superstar. Jesus Christ Superstar was written by people who are not Christian. They are not Christian. They are atheist, but they recognise this as an amazing story and wrote amazing music and amazing lyrics, and it's been staged all over the world since 1972. Movies, live productions, so much. So you might go, I just want to do it on Jesus Christ Superstar. And maybe that musical has meant that someone who never knew anything about Jesus learnt something about Jesus. That might be what makes it a sacred story. Um, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, another fun musical written by the same team. The Prince of Egypt, you might have watched a cartoon of that when you were little. It's also a musical. Godspell. And underneath that, because I could only find one poster, this is where we get into the passion plays. So passion plays are plays of Bible stories there's a really cool place in Germany called Omaramagal. Omaramagal. I can't say it with a German accent. Yeah, Omaramagal. So Omaramagal, Passion Plays, been performing there since the Middle Ages, so since like the 12 and 1300s. And they come, they have this big festival and everyone comes from all over the world and they watch these people act out the Bible stories. Interestingly, though, I talked about it with Mrs. Hins, and at Mugara Dam, which is just near us here, they do passion plays at Mugara Dam, and you can find lots of stuff on the internet about that too. So that's more of a, a like a local southeast Queensland community thing, but it's the same deal. You might go, I want to find out about passion plays. Why do people still put them on? Who goes and watches them? What are the stories of the passion plays? Is there a special way you have to act them? Can anyone do them? So there's just one little poster of passion plays dance there's a youtube link there to a cool some sort of south american culture i don't know what it is but a jingle dance so you can actually see the dance and if you liked that you could look it up and go what is the sacredness of the dance what does it mean and then there's some of indigenous aboriginal indigenous dances and a particularly daggy one of a christian liturgical dance 
we know Mrs Hum here creates a beautiful liturgical dance every year for um, the end of year service. Hers are just so much nicer than many of the daggy ones you can find on the internet. Uh, lots of communities, Christian communities around the world, like to tell the story of whatever it is through dance. And if you are someone who likes dance, you might go, I want to do that one. I want to explain how the moves that they are doing signify parts of the story or parts of that worship. I think that's the end of the PowerPoint. So I'm going to go back to my other document again. This one. So we talked about all that. Then I've got some scaffolding for you still on that document. What you might put in your introduction, how you put your link in, what you're going to research. So what's the spiritual perspective? What's the relational perspective? What's the personal perspective? That'll give you some structure to write or talk about. Yes, Mrs. Blundell? There's absolutely no way you can because there's so much breadth of what you're doing here. But they're not going to do that anyway because they've got honesty and integrity here. Yeah, Mrs. Blundell must have been talking to someone who was being naughty at the beginning when I did say, you're not going to AI it. You're not going to. There's no point. You are learning nothing. There might be little sections, talk about with your teacher how you could use AI to help you with some of your research, but you're not going to produce your result this way because you're just cheating yourself. You're not learning anything. But this is fun and creative, so you should be able to manage this. Um, conclusion, bibliography. All right. I feel like I don't want to stay here, but I know I have to because Mr McKenzie says I have to stay here. I'm wondering if there are any questions that are useful for the whole group that maybe I can answer at this point. Does anyone have need something clarified further? And I'm just going to stay, even though I want to walk over there closer to you, I'm going to stay here. Do we think we understand what we've got to do? Yeah, okay, well, 